How you doing, man? Uh, I'm not. I'm not doing too good in terms of what you're asking. Um, I feel like the whole world is looking at George Floyd's murder as an exclusively racial matter. And I really don't think that that is an empirically valid way of looking at what happened to that man. I want to hear more about and that. Let me, time, let me introduce this. Uh, excuse me, John. Excuse me. I, I didn't properly, you know, this is the Glenn show. I got to say that bloggingheads.tv, Glenn Lowry with John McWhorter. I'm at Brown University professor of economics, and John is at Columbia University professor of the humanities. In effect, uh, and uh, we are the black guys at blackheads.tv, which is why we are starting off not feeling so good about uh, what's going on in the country, especially around race relations and the incident of the uh, killing of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis. John, you were saying you're not sure that it's about race? Yeah, and I know that to the whole world that sounds utterly insane. But at this point, it's not like with Black Lives Matter originating uh, back about five years ago, where we were actually at a similar point. I remember having a hard time getting things written at that time anywhere except conservative outlets. But this is larger, and it's not because of anything different about social media. Something really significant has happened with this particular case. And, you know, we're watching not only the American intelligentsia, but you know, every state in the union, people are out on the streets. My hometown of Philadelphia, people are crowding the streets and people who don't even speak English in other parts of the world are just on this. And, you know, I, I think that the cops can be real monsters and something really needs to happen about the cops. But the idea that the cops are marauding against black lives is vastly oversimplified. It's unfair to a lot of the cops. And yet, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help us to sit and, and cry weakness. But I can tell that beyond certain circles, we simply can't be heard and that people are going to actually think that we're crazy or as some people are calling you to malevolent almost. And that can be frustrating because, you know, it's not like I think that I've got some lock on truth with a capital T, but I do know that most of the people who are looking at this aren't looking at the whole picture. Let, let, let me just ask you, John, excuse me for interrupting. I, I just want to explore with you a little bit of the depth of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. How can it not be connected with race? As you point out, people in the streets all over the country, et cetera, et cetera. Every commentator in every organ, every television personality, every celebrity, every editorial writer and whatnot, they're all conceding the point that there's an issue on race and the cops, politicians from the former president Obama said, I'll, I'll stop. Everybody thinks it's about race. How can you think it's not about race? Well, <laughs> two very quick things. In 2016, a white man named Tony Timpa was killed in Dallas. And Tony Timpa was intoxicated and called the cops because he was afraid he was going to be of a harm to himself. They put him down on the ground, put their knee in his back so that he couldn't get up and kept him down like that for 13 minutes. He was pleading for his life and it was recorded. And those cops killed that boy, that man, that young man, and they got off for it. That happened. We never heard about that because he was white. But there was, and I asked before when we did this, I said, I don't know if there's a black George Floyd. And I'm sure you heard too, as soon as we laid that one down, that there was a black George Floyd. And in answer- You mean a white George Floyd? Yes, a white George Floyd. And in answer to the objection that people are gonna level, yes, black people are killed disproportionately in terms of how much we represent of the population. But there's a really simple figure involved in this, which is that black people are two and a half times more likely to be killed in that proportional sense than white people. Black people are also approximately two and a half times more likely to be poor than white people. There's a socioeconomic aspect to all this. Being poor makes it more likely that you're gonna run in with a cop and the cops sometimes kill you, which is a grievous thing. But the idea that it's all about race is oversimplified when I think that it is really a socioeconomic factor when it comes to who gets killed. And then as you and I know, there's plenty of data showing that really 
Whenever anybody does a study of this, almost whenever anybody does a study of this, they show that there is no bias among the cops in terms of who they shoot and kill. This happens to white people all the time in massive numbers. And so do the cops harass black people more? Yeah, that seems to be true from studies too. And that's a major problem. But that George Floyd died because he was brown, it just doesn't go through. And yet there are many, many people who would think that we were talking backwards to say this. Yeah. So it's just, sure. you, you, feel, you feel like you don't belong in the world sometimes. So did George Floyd, but you know, his problem is more serious than ours, but still. Well, okay. I mean, you're using the first person plural here and I'm not going to disavow. I'm not going to leave you out there twisting in the wind all by yourself. <laughs> I, I'm not uh, really in disagreement with you, but I do think it's important to push. So let me try a couple of things. One of them is history. We have a history in this country. Race has been a part in policing and conflict and goes way back. And we could, it's not just the most recent incidents. It's not just, you know, Michael Brown or Sandra Bland or Freddie Gray. It goes all the way back. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not talking about slavery here. I'm talking about policing urban districts in the north and the west of the country, et cetera. It's, you know, it's a very old story. Um, B, we've got a police culture, which at least, you know, in some places at some times can be criticized as being, um, you know, racially insensitive, and that's putting it mildly, uh, as being uh, physically dominant and brutal. And, you know, the studies that you were talking about just a moment ago uh, do provide some evidence of prior study, for example, of the use of uh, non-lethal force against citizens by police showing racial bias and so on like that. So we got a history. So that's one point. One point is uh, the history uh, weighs in heavily here. Another point is, you know, it's a, it's a virtual point. I mean, it's, it's kind of like racial domination is broad across many areas of American life and the place where the rubber hits the road where it's most emotionally powerful is policing. So it becomes the site for a larger discourse and contestation in society around racial issues. So people are uh, frustrated and uh, angry and uh, injured by, quote unquote, white supremacy in the workplace, white supremacy as they see it in American politics with the guy who's in the White House, et cetera. White supremacy as they see it in the differential incidents of the pandemic on black people. So they've got a, they've got a boatload of grievance. And then something like this is catalytic and it becomes the instigator for a, a, an expression of more general uh, frustration. So uh, it is about race, even if it's not about race. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, I do. And all of that makes sense. Some of this is also modern history in that I wouldn't be having this conversation with you 20 years ago. I think that the cops have made major reforms over the past couple decades. It would be impossible to say in 1975 that there was not nakedly racist bias among a great many policemen, you know, most of whom had grown up in what was a different America anyway. You know, this was, even when I started writing, losing the race back in 2000, I had a whole section about this. And in, in that section, I mostly sounded like anybody you would expect from usual sources. But the question is whether you can look at it this way now. So yeah, there's a history in the black community, but let's face it, an awful lot of the people who are protesting now never knew that history, whatever color they were. If you're, if you're 30 years old, I'm not saying that that makes you too young to participate in a protest movement, but you weren't around dealing with what your city's cop force was like in 1975 or even 1985. What most people are thinking about is Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, etc., where they're thinking that those episodes simply must be largely all about race. And it worries me that that analysis hasn't worked over the past 20 years the way it would have before. We don't acknowledge progress. And who wants to talk about progress when somebody you know, has just had their life snuffed out? But the facts here seem so plain that sometimes I find myself thinking, should I just shut up? Because sometimes the facts aren't important. Sometimes sitting here and you know, what maybe what really needs to happen. And there's a question for you. What needs to happen is that the cops need to be reformed. And that would have so many benefits on so many levels. The cops need to be blown up and started again. 
Now, here you and I are saying, well, you know, technically they kill, you know, many more white people. And if there's a disproportion, it's because of socioeconomics. So, you know, Floyd did not die because he was black, technically. Maybe nobody wants to hear that, and maybe they don't need to hear it at this point. Maybe it's too picky a point. If the cops do harass black people more, maybe the point that they don't murder black people more isn't valuable in this particular setting. Sometimes I think, am I being a, a, a tattletale in the, in the fifth grade or something? What, what do you think about that, that this isn't the time for the points that we're trying to make? Uh, I think this is the time that we must make the points that we're trying to make. And now I will include myself in that first person plural, uh, because I, I actually don't disagree with you at all in what you've been saying, but I see what the other arguments would be. I think we have to because we're in the grip of hysteria. Um, when um, staff at the New York Times say that um, the um, editor Bennett uh, decision there, the editorial page, uh, op-ed page editor to publish Tom Cotton's um, essay calling for federal troops to keep the peace in American cities if necessary. Some of the staff there, the African Americans I gather, I'm just talking about what I read in the newspaper, said that they were put physically in danger by the piece that their editor decided to run in their newspaper because I suppose they're black and they might be covering or part participating in demonstrations and then the federal troops might somehow fire on them and then they might be hurt. How absurd is that? How absurd is that? Running an editorial puts somebody in danger because it advocated a position that you disagree with, a position that I don't agree with myself. But goodness, um, you've got people saying that they're afraid to go, I'm talking about people like you and me, okay? Make the same income, live in the same neighborhoods, wear the same clothes, have the same occupations. I'm talking about they feel physically threatened to be in the presence of a police officer. That's hysteria, it's hysterical, okay? It's like saying I won't leave my house because I'm gonna be struck by lightning. Okay, the idea that that incident with Mr. Floyd somehow is emblematic of the experience of African-American is ridiculous. It's completely disconnected from reality. Okay, no one wants to say this. How do you end up in a conflict with the cops? How did that happen? How does that happen? You actually have to do something. I'm not blaming Mr. Floyd. Please don't get mad at me. I'm just making an obvious point that the cops, <laughs> the cops don't just drag you out of your vehicle and start choking you, man. Okay. Now, what's my point? My point is, my point is simply this. What happened to him is unlikely to happen to you unless you end up in a similar disputation with the cops. Now, again, I'm not saying don't live or else the cops will kill you. All I'm saying is in estimating the quantitative magnitude of the risk to your life, consider that it is circumstantial, that it depends upon actual circumstances in which one finds oneself. So, so I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think we have to speak out because of hysteria. And I think we also have to speak out because the stakes here are absolutely huge. What do you think about defund the police? You know, that's the new slogan now, defund the police. Uh, well, what do you think about uh, uh, basically turning a blind eye to violence and saying ridiculous things like the loss of Mr. Floyd's life as tragic and outrageous as it was somehow justifies or causes us to look askance at absolutely despicable behavior, burning down the small business of the Poor fellow who's tried to scratch out a living around the corner. Come on, there's no excuse for uh, firing on police officers for throwing projectiles at them. Um, so I don't know, there's a sense I feel in which uh, it's a responsibility to, to try to speak out against these things. And this, uh, the huge thing here is whether or not the loss of Mr. Floyd's life was uh, a pro a pro is properly taken as being indicative of a white supremacist domination of black bodies. <laughs> it amazes me that even that we even speak such sentences. You know, this is a rare time when I am not going to do my thing of suggesting to you that your disgust is not 
you know, not not empathetic enough because I'm angry this time too for some of the same reasons you are, and I have had to restrain myself from really thinking in my head that the people in question are not well. And I always have to remind myself, if it's that many people who are doing this, you can't call it insane. And I really don't like calling people crazy, but unfortunately there are people who are truly disgusting me. And that is, you know, professional black people living lives that almost anybody on earth would envy, who are walking around pretending that they actually feel physically threatened by the police when they walk down the street, when they're just minding their business, who are pretending that what happened to George Floyd and what it supposedly symbolizes is making them so upset that they're so traumatized by this that they can't be expected to do the work that they would normally do. And that's not anything that I heard about at the New York Times. But I'm seeing again and again in various organizations that I'm not going to name, Black people saying, I can't be expected to do this because I'm so traumatized. Now, the one that we can name yeah. is um, UCLA. Is it UCLA where we yeah, have Yeah, it's UCLA. We happen to have heard from someone that's on the faculty there who wants to remain anonymous, making us aware of the brouhaha ongoing within UCLA community where instructors with respect to final examinations have been asked to give a special dispensation to their black students because those students are bearing such a heavy emotional burden at this difficult time for the country. That is theater. That is melodramatic theater. That is trumpeting weakness as a form of strength. And I've never seen it done to such an epidemic degree. I think of it as a, as a fringe phenomenon, but this, people actually trying to shape their actions in this world or what they're considered responsible for on the basis of this noble victim complex, this is really not good. And when it comes to individual cases that I have encountered of this, and I want people to know that I'm not talking about any Columbia undergraduate, I'm talking about other things that I do where somebody, you know, black of a certain demographic as in educated and privileged says, I can't be expected to do this. You know, I'm grieving right now. I'm utterly disgusted. I, I think in a way it's exploiting something very sad that happened to that man in Minneapolis in, you know, in, in favor of something that in a sick way, I shouldn't say sick, makes those people feel good about themselves when really you could feel good about yourself because you work for the fucking New York Times. Isn't that good enough? You know, why do you have to have this martyr complex? And, you know, I think I know why. I've tried to figure it out for a very long time now, but to see it in action to this degree is well, it scary. Raises, it raises an interesting, this is just on the issue of the times, and, and but it's emblematic of things going on in other institutions. Certainly some of my colleagues here in the academy, I don't know about at Columbia, but here at Brown, you know, it's like there are two viruses. There's white supremacy and there's the COVID-19. Uh, we're, we're struck with, uh, on the one hand, the disproportionate impact on black people of COVID-19, but on the other hand, the imperative that we show solidarity with and that we get out and protest against the other virus, which is uh, white supremacist policing. Oh, how burdened we are uh, because we have to fight on all these multiple fronts, this, this kind of uh, mentality. Uh, we saw it among students and not only students of color uh, at the time of the shutdown where uh, we had to recalibrate our courses and figure out how do we evaluate people. And there was, you know, there was talk at Brown, I don't know about again at Columbia about universal pass. Everybody should just get a pass. There'd be no letter grades. And that is what happened at Columbia. You know, so, yeah. Oh, that is what happened there. Yeah. Um, what we it did. It wasn't here, racialized, but yeah, that's what we had to do. No, it wasn't racialized here either. We, we gave students the option of uh, going to electing pass no credit as their grading option after the ordinary deadline would have expired for them to mm -hmm. do so. So any student who wanted to, exempt themselves from a letter grade had the option but the universal pass is a as a different kind of policy because it insists that you not afford the option to people to exempt themselves because that way anybody who takes the option of exempting themselves wouldn't be marked if everybody got a pass you wouldn't, oh, you wouldn't let me make it clear at columbia it was everything was made pass fail so you could be failed but of course 
And it's yeah. very rare that a student is going to perform at so low a level that you're going to fail them. So in effect, it meant everybody got a P. I'm just distinguishing between everybody getting a P or everybody getting the option to go to getting a P right. no, or a letter grade. In the latter case, people who do not exercise the option of the P and who end up with an A are really getting a superior grade in the course to the person who got the P. Right. So it, anyway, it's, it's a side point. I, I'm just saying there's a lot of pampering going on. A lot of people have expectations that, you know, the emotional burdens of uh, this time and, you know, the burden of uh, having to protest, because you do oh. know that's, that's an obligation. And, you know, how can you study and protest at the same time? Yeah. And I mean, what really stuns me, this is a corollary of all this, is that, you know, history is going to be interesting during this moment in so many ways. One minute, the idea is that when you step outside, you're supposed to wear that mask, certainly when you go inside. But for about the past month, the etiquette has been not only the science, but to an extent, the etiquette. Even if there's no one anywhere around you, you're supposed to put on that mask. Those of us who have small children, you know, are dealing with that. We have to put these masks on our children and they don't know, they don't quite understand why. You got to put on the mask and you're supposed to stay away from other people. And it's been really hard. Then the day after, once there are these protests, there are all these people out in the street and quite a few of them are wearing masks, but just as many aren't in most of these cases. And even if they are, everybody is, you know, chic by jowl for the most part. There's all this yelling going on because that's how a protest works, but that kind of transmits the virus more. And all of a sudden, considered impolite to talk too much about that, or you have serious people such as Mayor de Blasio here in New York City saying that, well, Fighting racism is a priority here, when just 10 seconds before, everybody is making it sound like COVID is the bubonic plague. And you're not supposed to go anywhere near anybody, even in the mask, unless they're your nuclear family. And all of a sudden, and wait, just, just one bit. And we have to remember that in New York City, 10 minutes before this, de Blasio had presided over breaking up ascetic funerals. So all these people are crunched together inside and outside. That's got to go despite their religion. But then once everybody's out in the street, as far as he's concerned, everybody gets a pass on that. What about the medical science? But apparently anti-racism trumps even medical science. I can't believe what world we're in. I didn't know it would go that far. I'm stunned. I can barely process that. It's very revealing, isn't it? I mean, first of all, <laughs> the power to define the normative climate by the... Um, uh, whoever has uh, got the megaphone, uh, the mayor of New York City, the uh, editor and publisher of this or that network or a newspaper or whatever, they define our reality. So as you say, a moment ago, I had to be very careful about interacting with anybody at an amusement park or a sporting event or a worship service or a funeral or a wedding, I can, and et cetera, because of the uh, deadly virus that we all had a social obligation to suppress. Um, and uh, if comparable gatherings at a spring break on a Florida beach or uh, at a, a, a spontaneous Trump rally or at a protest against the lockdown policies or anything else with unmasked people running around or at a Holy Roller uh, uh, Pentecostal church service, that the devil's uh, spawn, the, the, right. the, all you would be reading about on MSNBC and CNN and the New York Times and whatnot would be uh, how these people are violating and oh, the rest right. of us, they have a social obligation and uh, you know, uh, and it's uh, mayors would be deploying state troopers to break up the gatherings mm -hmm. uh, in the interest of public health. Now, that was just, as you say, a moment ago. And now, uh, you know, the spontaneous uprising would not. But why? But why? Uh, because it didn't really, did it have to do with the scientific certitude about the public health implications of uh, this or that? Um, or that was a paper thin rationalization for whatever it is was, was going on, or it was a story that could be easily, easily overturned by another narrative, which was really orthogonal to it. There are two viruses, <laughs> you know, here, here to be fought that we have to bounce them off again. In other words, if I had said, let's count the blight on lives caused by the shutdown and put a dollar sum on that, and let's count the likely estimate of the number of lives saved, put a from uh, the shutdown, and let's put a dollar estimate on that. And, and if it comes in at more than $10 million a life, let's not do it. Everyone would have called me the crassest, you know, most despicable and immoral person in the world. 
Uh, but if I say uh, don't gather in large numbers on the streets of Washington, D.C., Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, et cetera, uh, because it endangers public health. And oh, by the way, have you noticed uh, the uh, tremendous damage that people are doing as, uh, you know, whatever? But I mean, that's just a side point. You know, there are some in the looting. I didn't really, that's not because I know there's a First Amendment. But here, notwithstanding the First Amendment, please don't gather. Um, you know, people would call me uh, ridiculous on the wrong side of history. So I, I mean, and I don't know how this plays. I just wonder how ordinary Joe and Jane out there observing all of this then come to think, don't they feel manipulated by the, the media and the powers that be? Don't, don't they feel like it's a shell game that is being played against them? And, and you know what? They do. And that's something that social media helps us to realize. You and I are having a conversation where, unfortunately, we have to lapse a little bit into cliche because I'm realizing more and more. I tend to resist when people put it this way. But we're talking about positions of people in a certain kind of power. You've said this to me before. We're talking about academics, we're talking about media people, we're talking about public officials. This gets less common as you go to different realms of society. And one way that I know is this, and I need to make a, this is, this is gonna seem so self-inflated. I don't mean it that way. I just, I don't wanna hurt people's feelings, but I wanna say something to our viewers and to people who may be new to us or new to me. Glenn, I don't know if you're getting this, but. I'm getting about 25 emails and tweets a day from just people out in society who want to know what they can do to help a narrative that is less histrionic than the one that we're talking about. Often these messages are very long. They're, they're confessional. People are clearly very upset. And folks, I have to say, I'm sorry, but I no longer have time to respond to those messages. It's not that I don't want to read them. It's not that I'm not interested, but I can't get through 25 of those requests and testimonials a day. I have too much else to do. And so I say to you, I feel you. Thank you for listening to me. But at least for the time being, I would say probably for the next three or four months, I can't answer any more mail about this, this sort of thing. It's not that I don't like you. It's that I literally don't have time. I have children and, I'm, and I have many jobs. I'm really sorry. However, now that I have said that, they're there. I mean, I've I, probably gotten at least 300 of those since George I, I've, Floyd. I've gotten that, a ton of these messages. Yeah. I know what you're and it's talking not, about. And people, I want you to know, it's not that I'm saying that I'm some big deal. I can imagine how, yeah. how much mail various other people get. But still, it means that there is a groundswell out there. Because for every one of those people, just like with cop killings, you see one person, you figure there are three others you didn't know about. Every one of these people, there's somebody who's not writing us mail. They get it. It's just that they're not running New York Times or New York City or, you know, the 1619 Project, et cetera. So they are there. But the question, as they all are often asking, is really how can they have more power? All these people who ask me, on my school board, everybody has gone crazy. How do I speak some truth to these people? And a lot of the people who write that to me are black. And what, what is the answer to that question? What is there to be done about this? Or is there nothing? You know, that's the, that's the question. Is this a hopeless situation or, you know, I wonder what you think about this. I think we have to be mindful of um, and I say this with modesty of our particular situation in this national discourse. Uh, we are black. OK, I mean, we're the black guys. Mm -hmm. um, we we are we are contrarian to the extent that we agree and we don't agree about everything, but um, we are the contrarian. So the kind of message that we're putting out, like the message we're putting out right here, right now, not so sure that George Floyd's killing was a racial event. I mean, that's an extraordinarily contrarian thing to be saying in the midst of uh, a movement, so-called movement that's being mounted against police violence and uh, white so-called white supremacy. So we're contrarians and we're black. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we work for these uh, prestigious institutions. So we have a certain amount of status and whatnot. So there's something, um, you know, uh, more than just casual about our, about our interventions and people latch on to it for a variety of reasons. Uh, many of our detractors are detractors in part because they feel that we betray uh, our people as black people by the contrarian positions that we take. And, and many of our, uh, our fans are, are fans in part because they are just extraordinarily relieved to be able to hear a black person saying something which they take to be sensible, but contrary to what they expect black people to say about certain very sensitive issues, mm -hmm. which they think themselves 
and hence in hearing us say it, they, they feel somewhat comforted that they're not, you know, that they're not racist for thinking, for thinking it themselves. Uh, so, I mean, I've gotten, I, I put a letter in the city journal. I had, oh, I, yes. I had written a letter objecting to the dear colleague uh, note that came to me from the president of my institution, Brown University. As many college presidents have done, I guess maybe most of them have sent around notes saying they decry what's happening in our country and that they're on the right side of history, saying that in so many words. And my president did, and it just annoyed me no end. Uh, and I say so at length in, in my uh, rebuttal that's printed in the in the City Journal. And um, I, you know, the, there are uh, hundreds of comments there uh, from people who've reacted, and they are ten to one, twenty to one favorable. Of course, it's a selective audience. I've gotten, God knows how many, 25 a day, probably more than that. And I've got, you know, I just got the, you know, my thing says a thank you for the note kind of thing. I can click with one click. That's kind of how I respond because I feel like I have to respond. <laughs> but I, I can't, I can't even read them all for the reasons that you've just stated. Yeah. Uh, but they're all saying things like, thank God, thank God for you, thank God for you. Now, I, again, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just giving you, and this is not a scientific polling by any means whatsoever, but it certainly is indicative of something of a hunger out there It is uh, for people yeah. to, to hear something different. And Glenn, if, if I may, stress for somebody who's hearing this for the first time, most of these people who are writing you are not bow-tied Republican males. It's not only them. That's it's right. a wide cross-section of people, genders, races, ages, it's folks, as people like to put it. It's Many of them are graduate students and undergraduates. I'm getting yeah. letters from them. They're colleagues, High you know, school. professors in different fields at different universities around the country. Yep. So yeah, uh, there's, it's there's something. Those, and it's, I, I think that means something. And so we're talking about a kind of a localized <laughs> virus. And you know, one thing that I've also gotten when I made the announcement that I'm writing this book, all of a sudden I'm getting this flood of links to things that I would never have seen before. Uh, the, this group of people helping me write this book. Folks, thank you for that. That's fine, keep that coming. But the testimonials, you know, just I've run out of time. But yeah, there's a groundswell out there of people who understand it. It's all these Megan Downs. It's, it's people like Megan <laughs> she'd Dom. Be, she'd be pleased yeah. to hear you say that. <laughs> yeah, it's Megan Doms out there. And you know, some people like to say, well, she's just white. But there are so many black yeah. Megan Doms I hear from. And some black people are going to say, but they're all from the Caribbean. And I'm going to say, no, they're not. There are a lot of people who get this. It's just that they don't run the media organs. They are not college presidents. And so I'm beginning to really wonder, what is the answer to the question? of what you do. My own sister actually saw the announcement about the book and she doesn't want to see me get torn up in the media the way I was when Losing the Race came out 20 years ago. I get that. And she said, you know, make sure to offer solutions. And she's right. But when I, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, how do you get this form of a message out there? I'm wondering whether I should counsel people to face this mob down. You know, do you turn around and not talk to these people because it's like talking to a character out of the crucible and they simply can't listen? Or do you shout these people down and make them feel on the defensive? How do you, how do you try to push a mobbish, unempirical, self-focused ideology in the name of progressivism out of the room? How do you get rid of it? Do you just wait for the fashion to change? And you know, I'm sure that this, there's a science to this. People have thought about this, and I'm going to do some thoughting about it. But what do you do other than complain? I don't want to yeah. write a book where I fuck all these people. There has to be a reason for the book. And that's what I'm working on at this point. I, I have no uh, idea what the answer is. Or, you know, it wouldn't be just one answer. I think, though, that you want to pick your battles. You, you know, you don't want to fight every battle. You want to fight the battles that are that are really important. What hill do you want to die on? Yeah, yeah. You you really want to be uh, cautious about that. I got it. I got invited on uh, Life, Liberty, and Levin, the Mark Levin uh, Fox News show that comes on on Sunday evenings. Explain your rationale for this, because I didn't quite understand. Actually, well, uh, they want me to come on and talk about race relations, and I and I demurred, um, and. Uh, 
took the trouble of writing a letter back to the uh, to the uh, you know producer explaining why I wouldn't do it. Uh, my rationale was that uh, it's Mark Levin on Fox News. I don't know if you've ever caught him, but you know, or his radio mm -hmm. show or whatever. But you, you know who he is. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is an ultra conservative, uh, you know, Fox News uh, figure. It's not Sean Hannity, but he's you know he's in the same ballpark. People have very strong feelings about it. Mm -hmm. about him and about the network. So I'm Glenn Lowry, professor at Brown. I just attacked my uh, college president in the very public place for her saying that racial justice is an imperative of our time and for me saying that um, university should not have political positions that's basically what i said don't tell me what's right and wrong don't tell me what to think give me an ethical analysis if you will you want to do philosophy you want to do whatever but but don't don't tell me that brown values require a particular position on the police don't tell me that that's not the place of a university. That's basically what I was saying. And it feels like uh, thought policing. It feels a little bit like this is the party line. It feels a little bit like anyone in good standing here has to think the following way. When I get a letter from the president of the university that's signed by every top administrator, I'm talking about uh, the uh, vice president for diversity and inclusion, and I'm talking about the guy who runs the university's investment portfolio, and I'm talking about the dean of the School of Public Health and, um, you know, et cetera. And they all are signing the same very strongly worded political statement. So they all really do agree. They all actually have exactly the same views about that. That's brown values that's being trumpeted at me. I object. So I objected to that. And I do that. I have a piece that's uh, it's an interview that I gave to the um, Zurich um newspaper switch newspaper it was in german it's been translated to english and they're going to print it in the city journal in mm -hmm. a few days as soon as we get permission to print a translation of the of the uh interview i'm answering your question my question is why didn't i go on mark levin i'm taking a long time to answer it i'm just going to describe a couple of the skirmishes that i had and ways, ways i've stuck my neck out i had a piece in quillette as you know arguing that we should denounce unequivocally and immediately the violence and the looting without reservation uh, no ifs, ands, and buts. What about police violence? Well, what about police violence? Don't talk to me about police violence when people are burning down other people and attacking people and destroying property and, and committing assaults. Uh, that's wrong, full stop. There's no justification for it. So I had that piece. And then this interview that I gave to the Swiss newspaper, I say, well, what's going on here basically is that the real threat to African-American integrity of, of, of their physical person is crime crime committed in their communities, mostly by other black people, that fact is not so important. But the fact that they need the cops to keep them safe in their homes is important. So this wholesale attack on policing as such is ridiculous. It's completely contrary to the interests of black people. And oh, by the way, you know, there's a lot of black criminality. There's a lot of black crime. A lot of black people are committing crimes. Not all black people commit crimes, but a lot of black people are committing crimes. A lot of crime is committed by black people. A lot of violent crime is committed by black people. That's just a fact. Police officer who pulls over a car driven by somebody in a certain neighborhood at a certain time of day has to worry that there's going to be a gun underneath the seat to shoot him. The chance only has to be one in a thousand for that to be a profoundly significant risk for him. And if it's one in a hundred, God help him. Okay, now the fact that that's true certainly is pertinent and relevant here as we discuss the broader context of this situation. There's no talk about that whatsoever. And I go on, I say, look, man, here we are 50 years after the height of the civil rights movement. We still stuck with a lot of these problems. Obviously, the political program that the progressives have been pushing at us for the last half century haven't worked because after all, the places where most of these people live are in the control of progressive governments, the state and, uh, and the city level. Um, you're going to call that white supremacy? What kind of superficial analysis have you got of the social history of African Americans over the last hundred years where you've got a three word slogan as your uh, answer to, to the profound historical conundrum of persistent African American disadvantage? It's just racism? Nothing has changed in the last 75 years? You're, f you're a fool. The social health of African-American society, I'm talking about the strength of our families, the degree of law abidingness. I'm talking about the values that were taught to children. I'm talking about the level of abortion. I'm talking about many things. It was healthier in 1950 than it is today. Mm -hmm. 
it was healthier in 19, we were healthier in terms of the social coherence and the fabric of African-American life in 1950 mm -hmm. than we are today. Is that white supremacy's fault too? Mm -hmm. your, your analysis is, is um, infuriatingly ideological and blinkered. You've got a one note pony here. You've only got one thing to say about something that is historically profound. Now, coming from an 18 year old, I don't have a problem with that. That's what I expect. I call it sophomoric and I try to educate the person. Coming from the president of a university, from a senator sitting in the United States Senate, from somebody who writes for a major newspaper, it's infuriating. We shouldn't tolerate it. So uh, pick your battles. But by all means, fight for the truth. I mean, I think you have to fight. You know what? Here's something good that could come out of this. Maybe there's a kind of a real politique that we can see. I have always said that the cops were the main sticking point in the debate about race. And we can see that what brings people out to the streets, what makes perfectly safe people pretend not to be safe, brings out all of this drama, all of these tears. What creates this bizarre, almost Stalinist orthodoxy among the sort of people we're talking about with all these statements of allegiance, et cetera, that only comes from the cops. Racism takes many forms, perceived racism takes many forms. The cops is the main thing. In 1998 and nine, when I was researching losing the race, I sincerely went out to the extent that I could go out, had many conversations I had not had before with many different kinds of black people trying to figure out, why do you feel so differently than I do? And I found it's the cops. That's a huge point. And I hadn't grown up having to worry about the cops. Let's say that all of this creates real reform. Let's say that this really isn't just one more time. Frankly, it probably is. But let's say that it really creates reform and a generation of young black boys grow up not thinking of the cops as the enemy. If that were true, then around 2045, somebody, you know, I'll be, you know, old and, you know, looking backwards and I will think, look at what changed. It's not the way it was in 2020 during that COVID time. There's a whole generation of young black adults who are thinking straight instead of pretending. And that was a much smaller group in 2020 back when there was all of that hysteria and all of that fake, you know, stuff. Maybe it'd be worth it. Maybe, you know, history doesn't happen in straight lines. You and I know this. And a lot of the people we're talking about like to pretend that things are much simpler than they are. Maybe social history twists and turns and things are messy. Legends get printed rather than the truth. Maybe if the cops get changed after this time, after a while, you and I won't have anything to talk about anymore. That's the only good thing I can see coming out of this. Maybe that's just the way it has to happen. Maybe we're being too picky. And, and, and um, what is it? Uh, it's just going to fall from the sky? It's, is that um, osmosis? I mean, how is the change going to come about? <laughs> because you can't fool all the people all the time. And uh, if there is a tendency for people okay. who grow, very quickly, you grow up black, you might fall into this line of seeking warmth through pretending to be oppressed. That is a perfectly human thing. It may, let's say that happens to every second black person growing up in the United States, especially one degree. What enables it in 2020 when it's so obvious that things are nothing like they were 50 years ago is the cops. And you really might have some sort of experience with the cops, but even if you don't, you, you put yourself into that narrative. If the cops never did anything like that, you'd have to be crazy to, in 2045, still be walking around talking about white supremacy just because a white person looked at you funny or you didn't get a promotion or something like that. It just wouldn't make, it would make so little sense that people couldn't fall into it because there wouldn't be something theatrical and in your face to enable it. That's what the cops is. That's my guess. Where does he get this analysis? He's not a sociologist. No, I'm, I'm guessing. But it's my sense of how things seem to work throughout social history. It's just my guess. You think I'm being, you think I'm too optimistic? You think they come up with something else? I think it's going to, if it unfolds, yeah, I think you're too optimistic. I think we're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> but, but I think that if, if there is a turning of the wheel, it's not going to be because of anything that you and I say. It's going to be because... Um, there are going to be some uh, white people and white institutions, or white institutions, mainstream institutions, <laughs> that, 
that that basically eschew the uh, uh, the the party line. I mean, um, I'll tell you a story. I, I've told this story before. I, I, uh, I hope not here at Blogging Heads, but anyway, I'll just tell you a story. So there's a professor of constitutional law at the University of Chicago. His name is Jeffrey Stone. He came to Brown to give a lecture, and in the lecture, he was telling an anecdote. And in the anecdote, he was talking about a professor who used the N-word in his class, and this was he was going on to make some points about free speech. So he used the N-word in the course of telling the anecdote about the professor who used the N-word in the course of giving a lecture about free speech as a law professor here at Brown. As a student of color, woman stood up and said she was offended that he had used the N-word, even in the doubly quoted context that I just got referring to, to which his response was, you don't get to tell me what words you use. I'm respectful of you, and I told you what I was doing. I was telling you an anecdote about a guy to whom something happened when he used the N-word. You don't get to tell me what words to use, thank you, as if to dismiss her. Tell her to sit down, thank you for your question. You don't get to tell me what words to use. He ran out crying, I get it. No, no, she seethed. And there was murmuring in the room. And then afterwards, there was a little bit at the dinner, the faculty dinner afterwards, there was a little bit of chastisement of him having been quote unquote insensitive. I thought it was a signal moment. A signal, he just stood up for it. He said, no, you're not going to bully me here. I get what to year, choose. What year was that? This was uh, five years ago. OK. This was in the midst of the Ferguson stuff. OK. I get, in our provost had put on a lecture series to invite prominent people in to talk about ideas and whatnot. He says, no, 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 that, that, that's not OK. You, you're not the language cop in here. I didn't do anything. I did nothing wrong. If you took offense at that, that was on you. That's not on me. You don't get to control what I say. Mm -hmm. That took courage for him to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and there's a lot of stuff that's like that. There's a lot of stuff that's like that. Um, affirmative action. There's a lot of mediocrity advanced under the cover of affirmative action. A lot of people over their heads in positions. That's a fact. It's unspeakable. How many white people are sitting seething because they can't do anything about the incompetency that they're forced to put up with because the category has been favored, more than one or two. To this point, they've all been written off as disgruntled incel types who can't get a job in academia or something like that. I mean, the incel, they can't, they can't get a job. <laughs> they can't get but they're, they're involuntarily celebrate with respect to the workplace. You know, you see them, the pimply 40-year-old guys that were, you know, I'm, you know these guys. You know these guys. Who I know who you're talking about. And you can dismiss them with the back of your hand. You know, they're at Podunk State University somewhere. We're in the Ivy League. They think they're as good as we are, but we're black and we're in the, you know, these people are out there and you, you dismiss them. But I assure you that they are not alone. I assure you that there are many partners of white shoe law firms in D.C. and New York and Chicago and Los Angeles across this country with associates who are not pulling their weight, who happen to be of color. Of course, there are other associates who are not of color, who are also not pulling their weight, et cetera, et cetera. It's a thing called affirmative action. It's a thing called, there's a newspaper story if you don't promote, promote enough partners of color. There's resentment. You think people don't resent black crime? There's tens of thousands of victims. Okay, you, you, you think that they don't know that the assailant is black? For crying out loud. Do you think that <laughs> the demagogues like Al Sharpton running around this country spewing what they spew are not pissing off a huge number of people who are sitting quietly and determined to take their revenge at the ballot box or wherever? They pick up the newspaper and read the Happy Talk editorial about racial justice and whatnot, and they can see that this is just a black racist. I know you don't necessarily have to agree with that, John. I don't want to implicate you in my thing, but that the race card playing that's going on blatantly in our country, left, right, and center, is merely a cover for the failure of African Americans to pull our own weight too often. You know? Um, so that's what, and let me just finish my thought. What has to happen is white people, not, not everyone, I don't expect it to happen at Vox, 
I don't expect it to happen at the, at the Atlantic. God love you. But that white people, serious people, not, not right wing kooks, say enough. Glenn, I'm sorry, but everything that we're seeing over these weeks makes me quite sure that, that there being a significant body of whites in positions of power who are going to do that, the chance is is minuscule that they're not going to do it most human beings are not up for battle and being mauled that's something you and i for some sick reason don't mind that much but most people aren't up for that and they shouldn't be and it means that for many people they make a calculus they figure they'll put up with some cognitive dissonance in the name of being able to go home and spend the night having dinner with their families and to have a peaceable existence and so that will mean you know having the underqualified black candidate and you see me not vigorously agreeing with you too much because of a conversation that we had here two or three years ago where I openly told you that I was one of those people. I was hired as a linguist by Cornell, transparently underqualified. I speak well, I was okay, I was nowhere near as good as the people who I competed with. They gave me the job because I was black and because there was a special fund set aside for minority candidates so they wouldn't have to think about funding it with the, the, the money for their own, for, for their actual line. And this is not me, you know, coyly talking, not wanting to sound like I'm into myself. This is not me having had imposter syndrome. I was an imposter. The only difference between me in 1994 and somebody else hired under those circumstances is that I'm an inveterate, obsessive nerd. I honestly think that I was good enough. I just hadn't learned enough. And after about five years, I realized I was undercooked and I cooked myself. And so I now, I now know that I am good enough. But in 1995 and 1996, all I was was slick, well-spoken, funny, when I talk, I tend to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but the smarter graduate students could tell that I didn't. And I am hardly alone in that. I have seen it and I've seen the outcomes be quite different. But the white people who are responsible for these sorts of things are gonna keep doing it. You see new ones being minted all the time. It is too much of a burden to go against this current. So it's not gonna be them. They're, they're not gonna change in a way, I think it, so what am I saying? It has to be, uh, yeah. You're saying they're never going to change. Too. They're going to keep doing this. And so, who is it who's going to create the change? It's people out in society in an ordinary sense, but they don't. I'm thinking out loud. They don't have their hands on the levers, levers of power, and so it won't matter what they think. And so, it would have to be black people themselves who stand up for this sort of thing. That seems more plausible. If black people won't stand for it then affirmative action is different, but we're talking about a lot of other things. Yeah. If black people have a truly healthy self-image, they will not fall for exaggerated conceptions of what victimhood consists of. And there'll be a whole new race debate because it won't be considered the most authentic and urgent thing to do to pretend that you're more of a victim than you are and to teach white people to pretend to agree with you. So affirmative action is, is, is special. I have to think more about that, but with the other stuff, I think a lot of it could be just from the cops no longer being an issue. I'm hoping that. I don't know how you get the cops not being an issue, given the um, the demography and the topography, the way that we're organized socially and the, and the nature of uh, order maintenance. I mean, what, you, did you see what happened in Chicago over the uh, weekend when they were, uh, cops were putting out fires? Smile. Yes. I can't remember the number. Some inordinate number of people were shot dead. And the, the Chicago Sun-Times ran a piece where they just did a little one pair, paragraph bios on one after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, literally after another, after another. You know, there was a 13-year-old girl who was uh, out here. It was a guy who was, I mean, it was just heartbreaking. It was just heartbreaking. This is what I mean, Glenn. Yeah. All those people died, black people killing other black people, and that's considered not as important as what happened to George Floyd. You and I both know that makes no fucking sense at well, all. But, but, but I was just gonna say, if we have a different situation where the cops aren't thought of as an enemy, then suddenly the blinders will be taken off of people's eyes and they'll understand all of those black on black, you know, there are people who are mad at me now for saying black on black, this whole liturgy. Folks, I've written pieces about it. I'm gonna keep saying black on black. All of these black on black homicides 
will matter. People will see it as the horror that it is because they're not obsessing with the Darren Wilsons and the Derek Chauvin's. That's yeah, but my I'm point, not. my point, John, was that because those events are happening, the police who have to actually investigate those cases and police those streets come to the scene when someone calls and says there's a domestic disturbance, respond to a shopkeeper who says that uh, a robber has just fled with, et cetera. Those, those, those cops who are in those situations <coughs> um, are, you're going to have, if I chase enough kids down the alley, they're going to be incidents. Okay, I mean, I, again, I don't want to be misunderstood. The cops should be trained. There should be rules of engagement that are strict in the interest of protecting citizen safety. I, we could talk about them. Cops should be accountable when they break those rules. There shouldn't be any special treatment of them. They should be respectful of how they engage with their citizens. The culture police department should be uh, systematically and quite self-consciously shaped and guided in such a way as to minimize the bad behavior, et cetera. That, that should all happen. But notwithstanding all of that, you get enough encounters where cops have to arrest uh, six feet three, 280 pound people and put them in the backseat of a car. I don't care what color they are. So if you don't deal with the underlying phenomenon, which is crime, gosh, that's why the police are encountering people in difficult situations because of crime. Again, I'll say it again. The observation that I'm making does not in any way excuse police from not discharging their responsibilities in those situations as they ought to, okay, respectful of citizens and et cetera. But the reality here is that the disorder to which the police are responding, which they did not create, is the underlying driving engine. And the racial disparity and engagement in criminal activity is the first order quantitative explanation of the frequency of these events. I would say, there's gonna be an argument here, okay? We would have to go to the data. Um, conditional on the circumstances in which individuals encounter each other. This was Fryer's finding on the Houston data where he was very careful about the uh, cataloging of the uh, incident reports and so forth. A uh, conditional on the conditions under which the police encounter each other, they're no more likely to use deadly force against a citizen based on the citizen's race. They are more likely to use force like taser or handcuffing short of deadly, and that's a real issue. They're more, no more likely to use deadly force. However, the conditions in which people encounter each other are a consequence of the, uh, in which people encounter police are a consequence of the behavioral choices that people are making. As I've said here before, if you resist the cops, it's much more likely that you're going to end up being injured. That's not an endorsement of cops injuring people. It's simply a statement of fact. It's just a statement of fact. So I, I don't know. I'm not as sanguine about all of that. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know. There's a person who's thinking, yeah, but when a person resists, they shouldn't be killed. But I think that the, of course the crucial not. thing, the crucial thing, and yeah, they shouldn't. But they think of that as the smackdown point. They can't hear the first thing you said. But I think the, the, the key issue here is, I read a random tweet probably about a week ago, youngish black man who's writing, you know, it's clever in itself. He has Donald Trump saying, come on, black people, what the hell do you have to lose? And he writes, our lives. And it has like 4 million likes. Yeah, sure. What this guy is not thinking about is that many, many, many more white men, usually because they resisted arrest, are killed every year than black men. Yeah. And that, yes, there's a disproportion of black men, but that doesn't correspond to the idea of you keep killing us as if it's, you know, nine black men and one white man. And that it has a lot to do with poverty and the fact that poverty makes you more likely to wind up in a situation where you are resisting arrest by a cop. If you're poor and you get pulled over and you've got a lot of outstanding warrants, that's going to make it, you know, more likely that you're going to try to run away. I completely get what was going on with Walter Scott, what was going on with Sam DuBose. Of course, they didn't deserve to be killed. But yes, there are, you know, poverty has a lot to do with these sorts of things. And so, yeah, but that guy saying, stop killing us, unfortunately, our lives, the problem is that that message 
is received by a certain group of people. I guess it's Twitter, this, that, that group of people, that includes all these, these powerful people, as just, you know, biblical wisdom. Stop killing us as if it's only us who get killed. It's the wrong meme, frankly. But, you know, they, they don't want to hear that. Glenn, I've got to go pick up my daughters. Okay. Uh, that's good. Well, we've had a little talk here. Good to talk yeah. to you, John. Go pick up your yeah. lovely daughter. Which one? Or both? It's both. Uh -huh. <laughs> both of my lovelies. So, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for giving us some time here at the Glenn Show. We'll catch up again soon. Very uh, soon. Perfect. Take care. Have a good one.